In the case of Velikovsky, there is something high, and the cost of being himself has been very, very great. That is a condition to which I think the young profitably can be exposed. And if I had my way, every young undergraduate student in my college, every one, whether he's in the humanities or the hard sciences, would be required to examine the Velikovsky case. The academic establishment was saying to this man, you know, you're not safe. Sentiments familiar to us all as we watched what is now 45 years old. We've begun to examine the solar micronova possibility and will continue to do so, but where would Velikovsky and Talbot fit in there? Was it the planets that inspired the ancient stories or the sun? What causes the catastrophe and what are the effects on Earth? Looking back to Deleuze, Cuvier, Buffon, Leibniz and up through Hapgood and Einstein, their belief was that the revolution of Earth's crust caused a cycle of disaster. Whether it was a shift in tilt or the rotation speed, the results would indeed be terrible. Indeed, any heating or electric event at the low velocity zone could lower the plasticity and allow the ice caps to twist down. Any major electromagnetic shockwave could affect numerous aspects of the planetary system. Our sun's micronova would be well below the power shown by known recurrent nova in the galaxy, some of which go boom again and again, and it should not be considered impossible for our sun on a long time scale. If this was you, by the way, after the flash, you might be hoping for the planet slowing down its rotation just a bit to let this one get past Earth. But what if indeed the sun is merely a conduit for the galaxy or beyond in the cosmic web? While the heliosphere provides plenty of direct protection nearby to the star, like where we are, there's still the induction aspect. When the sun hits Earth with the CME, the magnetosphere blocks the particles, but that can induce dangerous currents in the atmosphere and in the ground. Well, if a galactic burst were to hit our star, the same inductive risk would exist here at Earth and on our sun, and this is where Dr. Paul LaViolette comes in. The galactic superwave is a natural extension of the scalability we know to pervade the universe. The big hurdle is observational capability and predictability. We can monitor the relevant solar aspects better than we can monitor the center of the Earth. We have absolutely no real way of monitoring for the galactic superwave. And by the way, once we saw the flash from the galaxy, meaning the photons had arrived, that would mean the main concern was there, since the particle burst would be eons behind it. I want to consider for a moment something that really should not be ignored. In the accounting of Major White's Pentagon meetings, they confidently said that they noted 12,000-year cycles and at least five major shifts of the crust. And I want to take a moment to show what satellite orbits look like because they actually represent what a circumference line would look like on a rectangular projection if it's not at the equator now. Major White said that the equatorial bulge and reversal of it after the next shift created a mountain chain and boundary creation event at the equator, so you can actually trace the lines of former equators. I have found a couple of them, and I have about four other suspects for the ones I've missed. But let's begin with the obvious crack up and down the Atlantic. Many people know that it mysteriously continues up into the polar circle, but it actually keeps going. The range in Russia here is not just parallel, but linear with the Atlantic Ridge termination, and it continues down on that same line after a little bend through the Japanese volcanic range and out the subduction protrusion exactly. Another great example would begin in the mid-Atlantic and then run eastward through Europe and into the Middle East through Iran and transitions into the Himalayas and then disappears until you realize that those lines of undersea mountains and volcanoes into the Pacific are following those previous lines in continuation. There is a crack underwater that runs up the East Pacific and breaks near the Cocos Plate, but the elevated Yucatan is in that line too, and then also on that line we find the Appalachian Mountain Range. There is an interesting turn to the Antarctic Ridge that points up a crack in the ocean hitting Africa that continues into the mountain and volcano range there, and then forms the coastline elevated above the sea as we keep going, and then into the intersecting Hindu Kush range that runs up into China and Russia. If Douglas Vogt is correct, then it's only a rotation speed change. The force will all be east-west crunching and pulling, and the north-south lines you see everywhere would be crimping of that force. It is indeed strange that so many under the ocean run north to south, and a drained ocean map is a good way to start looking. Now one could easily make the argument that between internal processes of Earth, solar events, and impactors, and especially if you add in a galactic superwave, maybe you don't need planets in chaos, and this might be true, but then again, maybe they're also part of the process. 
And then, of course, you have to accept Cuvier's charge from 1813 to explain all the evidence. And in fact, the coherence of ancient stories represents evidence. Whether there is enough evidence of the planet's involvement is ultimately a subjective question. A consistency of reports from around the world of catastrophes that are amazingly similar. But a lot of people thought it's just what people dream up when they have a lot of time or they're dreaming or whatever. It's just stuff that people naturally come up with. Velikovsky thought it was catastrophes that people witnessed and remembered as very different. The story of the sun and moon disturbed in their daily motion. As the ancient could not know that it was the earth that was disturbed in rotation. They thought the moon and the sun. This would be not enough. You had to go to all civilization, to Japan, to China, to India, to Persia, to Babylonia, to Assyria, to Asia Minor, to Greece, to Rome, to Judea, to Egypt, to Mexico, to Peru, to Iceland, even to East Indies. And the same story could have been found in all places, but differently told, so that it was no question of just borrowing from one nation by another. So this was World's Collision, the story of human memory of catastrophes that took place in historical times, but strangely, despite the fact that they were described in so many sources, as if non-existent for the scientific world. My line of thought was this. Venus erupted from Jupiter only several thousand years ago, twice meeting the Earth. And electrical discharges also took place between Venus and other celestial bodies, even its parental body, Jupiter. And Venus was observed by the ancient as a very brilliant incandescent body, rivaling the sun in its brightness. So it is also described by the Chinese, by the Babylonians, by the Mexicans. That regardless of whether one believed this to have stemmed from Velikovsky's theory, his prior rights to discovery ought to be recognized. And, that, and then we indicated that we did not accept his theory as such, but we did accept his discoveries. See, After we had written the letter, the argument was started again, and people did write to me saying that I perhaps should not have done this because clearly saying that Velikovsky had announced these things did not specify the truth of his arguments. And I indicated that I felt that a person who had made an announcement who had indicated certain things ought to be given, given credit for these things. Do you feel these are very unusual statements to have come true? Yes, they are very unusual because nobody suspected that Venus would be as hot as it was found to be. And people had no reason to suppose that radio waves would come from Jupiter and uh, that these other things would be found to be so, or the carbohydrates that are thought to be on Venus and things of that sort. It is a little bit difficult to, uh, to go back and to say, well, the story is not exactly so. We have the phenomena from all places, from the bottom of the sea with ash and with nickel, which is of meteoric origin, and the ash that covers all the bottom of the ocean. And you know, geologists today claim, like Professor Ewing uh, of Columbia University, that it was an encounter with a terrific uh, comet that spread, yes, mm. spread this ash. Mm all over the world, and now it's found evenly spread on the bottom of the oceans. And you have now the accepted view, which was not accepted only 10 or 5 years ago, that the terrestrial axis moved, and that pale paleomagnetism proves us that terrestrial axis, that magnetic axis, and possibly like Ankan and other of Manchester, claim that it the earth turned over. 
We know now from observation of Professor Danjon, director of Paris Observatory, that, that um, flares on the sun may influence the speed of rotation of the Earth and there were sudden changes. Only very recently we read even that Jupiter was subjected to strong changes and this also confirmed one of the latest of my point you had made. Yeah. We generally don't like to know that we are traveling on a accident-prone planet. The condition is the extreme professionalization and rigidification of institutions through which thought is supposed to occur. Extreme to the point where it begins to contaminate the fluidity and looseness of the freedom to think. Fluidity and looseness of ideas, of having ideas, and the freedom to think. I knew also that in my work will find quite an opposition, but I did not know the extent, the extent of this opposition and the violence. But time has creative power. The very fact that you came today to take those pictures and the mail of today and of yesterday proves that even in science, falsehood cannot live for too long.